introduction of what we're going to do this afternoon. Um, we're very pleased this afternoon or this morning if you're on the West Coast um, to be joined in this virtual BBA session uh, by Dr. John C. Towson. He's the Director of Optometric Service and the Office of Specialty Care Services at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, he's here to provide a brief overview of the status of VA, VA Health, VA Eye Care, excuse me, and the vital role that optometrists play in general eye care clinics and in the outpatient low vision clinics. Uh, Dr. Townsend is also an authority on vision research and the role of optometric care within the 13 blind rehabilitation centers nationwide. Uh, Dr. Townsend has been in his current position since the year 2000. And prior to that, he was the chief of optom optometry service within the great VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System and at the West Los Angeles VA Medical Center. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Florida, his Doctor of Optometry from the University of Houston College of Optometry, and he did his residency in hospital-based optometry at the Kansas City VA Medical Center. Um, following Dr. Townsend's remarks, we anticipate some time for questions, so if you'd use the raise hands function in Zoom, I will call on you to unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can use the, the chat function to ask the question. Um, so I've already taken more of my time I should, but so without further delay, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Townsend. Just uh, one more thing. We actually, when Dr. Townsend is finished, uh, don't go away. We have um, also have a, a short presentation and some interactive um, exchange with um, a couple of our representatives from OrCam Technologies. Um, so we'll introduce them a little bit further um, after that. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Townsend. Thank you for your patience today and and thanks for everybody that's present with us. All right, well, thanks to uh, you. I, th I appreciate the invitation and I, I thank Ms. Gernhardt who got me back on and uh, I'm glad that everyone can hear me. So I'll just get started. I'm gonna really start with some of the FY19 data and then give a verbal update about where we are in uh, FY 2020. Uh, one, one of the things that you probably are already aware of is that all uh, enrolled veterans are eligible for medical services. That includes uh, preventive health care services, optometric services, rehabilitative services, and surgical services. In FY 2019, uh, there are over 9.21 million enrolled veterans, and uh, during that fiscal year, 6.43 million veterans used uh, care at uh, the VA or uh, in community care. So that's a, a great number. Uh, typically in the year uh, 2020, I haven't seen the final numbers yet for enrolled veterans and people who've been cared for, but typically when we have uh, a recession or people are out of work and lose their health insurance, that we have more veterans signing up uh, for VA care and services. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there are more veterans who've enrolled for VA care or will do so in the next fiscal year in FY 2021, which, which begins October 1st. And again, we do have uh, who's eligible for the sensory neural aids that includes eyeglasses and contact lenses. Uh, we did update uh, the VHA directive on October 24th of last year. Uh, so that people who have a medical need for eyeglasses uh, will be able to obtain them. So here's uh, in FY 2019, we cared uh, for uh, quite a few veterans and actually a record number of veterans received care and services. 1.855 million veterans obtain eye care services uh, from optometry and ophthalmology uh, the information you can see on the slide here is that optometry cared for a record number of 1.48 million veterans, ophthalmology cared for five, over 551,000 uh, veterans, and obviously we, we refer to one another when ophthalmology care is needed, surgical care is needed, or perhaps they send to us for rehabilitation and uh, low vision rehabilitation, contact lenses, and just primary eye care. Uh, we also, in that year, had screened quite a few uh, veterans, 171,000 in the uh, diabetic teleretinal program. 
and uh, you can see we cared for a lot of people in the outpatient low vision programs, the low vision care program, intermediate low vision, and advanced low vision. In uh, FY 2020, uh, we were actually on track to care for a record number of veterans this year. We were going to care for over 1.5 million in optometry, and then the pandemic hit. And uh, then we were only seeing emergency patients uh, in optometry and ophthalmology at that time. So, uh, but we have gradually reopened as it's become safer to do so, and also having uh, adequate uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, as you know, you have to come into the VA for care and services. You have to have a mask, or uh, you'll be offered a mask before entering a VA facility. Uh, we also have a lot of cleaning and disinfecting that we're, that's going on. Uh, the best estimate that I have uh, right now looking at some information for 2020 is that combined optometry and ophthalmology will probably care for about 1.25 million veterans. So that's, you know, less, quite a bit less than last year. Uh, optometry will care for a little over a million veterans, and ophthalmology over 410,000 veterans will receive care. Uh, the teleretinal program, because it requires face-to-face -face care, uh, that was also, uh, patients weren't coming in for that, that, that was uh, shut down until it was uh, safer to, to do so. Uh, we're probably going to see, um, you know, quite a few less, probably over 90 2,000 veterans uh, from this time last year. Looking at the low vision rehabilitation uh, that's being provided, uh, we're going to care for over 15,000 or 16,000, excuse me, veterans this year. About uh, workload about 73% of what was in FY 2019. Uh, here's just looking at the eye care workload I didn't put in uh, for there. There was over 1.75 million pairs of eyeglasses provided to veterans last year, and we're probably on track uh, to provide uh, with prosthetic service about uh, probably about 1.2 uh, million eyeglasses uh, before the fiscal year ends. And you can see that we've been quite busy. Uh, Unfortunately, there's only so much we can do through um, telehealth. We've done a lot of uh, telephone consults, uh, some video connect, but because we use specialized eye equipment, we, that can't be replicated in a video uh, examination. So uh, about 95% of our patients need to have a face-to-face -face examination. Uh, this is the optometry workload. I mentioned it's going to be uh, significantly less at the end of this year. And I have a feeling that in uh, fiscal year 2021, it will be uh, quite a bit less even than this, this year because we had about four, almost about five months uh, of normal uh, patient load before we ended up uh, having uh, restrictions on, on people coming into the clinic. Uh, the telehealth program is still uh, quite robust and has actually turned into the eye telehealth screening program. And we're now screening not only for diabetic retinal disease, but also for glaucoma and macular degeneration. And we're only looking at people who are at high risk for vision loss, trying to get them uh, into the VA so that they can access VA care and services. You can see that we did quite well with the diabetic retinal exam. Uh, actually, the VA is the highest in the nation with over uh, 87 percentile. Uh, last year it was 86.67, and now it's 87.32 achieved year to date. So we're actually the highest uh, in the United States of any uh, healthcare organization. Uh, just taking a look at uh, prosthetics uh, contracts and how many uh, eyeglasses were provided last year, you can see it was over uh, nearly 1.76 million pairs of eyeglasses. Uh, through August of this year, uh, we pr VA provided 1.12 million pairs. Uh, contact lenses last year was 21, over 21,000, and we've done over 18,400. Uh, through August of this year. 
the CCTVs, uh, you can see there's 29, 25 devices were provided, and this year through August, it's 1,789. Uh, also, the optical aids for the blind, uh, we provided over 60,000 this year, uh, nearly 84,000 last year. And then the lens implants uh, for after cataract surgery, there were a record number of over 75,600 provided last year, and through August, it's uh, over 45,000. So obviously all the surgery, uh, surgical procedures were impacted also uh, during this time when it wasn't safe to perform the, these surgeries with the COVID outbreak. And, uh, you know, in optometry, we do the majority of the low vision rehabilitation along with other uh, rehabilitation specialists the blind, with blind rehabilitation service in partnership with them. And uh, we cared for over uh, 22,520 uh, veterans last, last year and uh, with outpatient low vision. And so far this year, we've done over 16,400 uh, visits. So that's not too far off. We're about 73% of what we, of the patients we were able to care for last year. Uh, some really good things that we've accomplished. We did uh, publish the VHAI and Vision Care Directive on October 2nd last year. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, revised and published uh, prescribing and providing eyeglasses, contact lenses, and hearing aids directive. Also working in partnership with the Vision Center of Excellence uh, with clinical recommendations on how to care for patients who have uh, brain injury. And also making sure that uh, we track them in the DeViver so that they aren't lost to long-term follow-up. And as I mentioned uh, briefly earlier, the teleretinal imaging screening program that was just for the diabetic uh, patients has now expanded uh, late this fiscal year in August and September to screening for patients at high risk for glaucoma and macular degeneration. And the VA has uh, been a leader in, in uh, telehealth and they had actually increased the RVU uh, values in January before we had this pandemic and relied so heavily on telehealth. So uh, the VA is still leading uh, you know, doing uh, virtual care. Uh, you probably are already aware of Secretary uh, Wilkie's four major VA priorities of customer service, uh, Mission Act, uh, electronic health record modernization with Cerner, which will be a multi-year process, uh, the business transformation so that we can have a greater, uh, better supply chain of uh, products and, and uh, PPE and, and other uh, devices that are used uh, in daily uh, clinics. And then Dr. Stone um, has uh, his three priorities, which are to restore trust, create a learning environment, and to modernize systems. So the modernization effort uh, uh, are, is multifaceted and it encompasses all, everything that I just mentioned. Uh, the modernization has 10 top things it wants to achieve. Commit, the first is to commit to zero harm and become a high reliability organization. They're streamlining VHA central office and they're reorganizing and so uh, optometry and ophthalmology will be uh, in the uh, surgery integrated clinical community and being realigned at central office this year. Uh, there's a lot of, of different uh, things looking to uh, eliminate redundancies and unwarranted variation across uh, clinical and operational service lines. And that's part of these integrated clinical communities of which there's one for rehabilitation that blind rehabilitation services is, is within. Uh, also, um, you know, with the Cerner, we're going to have the electronic uh, health records that'll be from when they're in the DOD to when they transition into the VA. Um, also, uh, trying to engage veterans in, in lifelong health. Uh, we've updated a lot of the uh, policies recently as we modernize. 
And also with the VA Mission Act, we're trying to improve uh, veteran access to care uh, because about a third of our veterans reside in rural or highly rural areas. And uh, working uh, to transform the supply chain and, and uh, fiscal management. So it's, it's been a, a very uh, busy year this year. It's been the most unusual year I think I've ever experienced in the VA. I've been with the VA 36 years now, uh, over 36 years, and I can't uh, recall so many different things happening all at the same time, but we uh, are still moving forward, and hopefully as we work through this pandemic, uh, you know, we, we will have some better processes in, in place. The one thing that I did mention initially was the fact that we have over uh, 9.2 million enrolled veterans and um, 6.43 million used VA care and services last year. And obviously, more veterans would access eye care services uh, if they could. And so uh, we're always trying to uh, determine that appropriate balance between VA delivered care in our VA medical centers, our outpatient clinics, our community-based outpatient clinics, and that, that we will provide in-house because we also need to train the next generation of healthcare providers for the nation. So um, it's a delicate balance as we work with our affiliates to make sure that we're able to provide the care and also train uh, healthcare providers for the future. Uh, we're always looking uh, to improve our uh, productivity. Uh, obviously, with the productivity goals that we had for this year are not achievable uh, because of not being able to see as many patients uh, this year. But when we get back into the normal cycle of, of patient care, I think that we'll be able to uh, uh, deal with that. There are some strategies of how you can try to make up the deficit that we have in patients who probably would have wanted to access care. Some of it's having extended hours. Uh, some of it may be having weekend hours. Some of it will be community care, but everyone has many of the same constraints where you have to make sure that each, after each patient that the exam room is uh, disinfected appropriately. So, it, and you have to have a lot of social distancing in the waiting room so you can't um, have as many people in the waiting room at one time. I think as we go into the fall, because the weather is not so hot or cold yet, um, we'll be able to, they're doing a lot of different things where they contact you and text you to come in for your appointment. So I think that we're gonna have uh, you know, a lot of innovation that, that occurs as, a, as part of this. And let me see, I think that uh, that's all for my presentation. Uh, I'd be glad to take any and all questions at this time. Does anyone have any questions right now? Hey Stuart, this is Paul, Paul Kaminsky. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Uh, as far as uh, bioptic lenses, is the VA gone to optic, bioptics that are somewhat less noticeable than the ones that gave out in the past? The, the ones that they were uh, spectacle mounted ones? Yes. I, I would uh, assume that they're still using those, but they also have access to some of the uh, newer electronic devices that are out there if it meets the veterans' needs and they have to receive the appropriate training on the use of the device and care of the device. Yeah, because the last, last set of bioptics they the VA gave me were uh, basically they sit on the outside of my glasses, very heavy, very uh, ugly looking. The ones that the, mm -hmm. they gave me in the Navy basically sat inside my lenses and you could barely see them. Uh, but somebody else decided they wanted them more than I, I needed them. So somebody stole them on me and been able to, haven't been able to get them replaced for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, 
And right now, I, I could use the, the dual doesn't work any anyway for me anymore. But a single one in my right eye would be a, allow me to see the, the little guy on the uh, walk don't walk sign across the street. But do you know the manufacturer of the device that you used to wear? Or are they have they signed up to be on the VA contract? I, I do know who, who manufactured them, but no, I have not asked them if they, they are on the system. I guess I could do so that. If they were to be on the system, uh, then there would be, you know, the VA would, would be able, we'd be able to pre prescribe it more likely than not. You wouldn't have to know a, a Dr. Townsend optometrist in uh, Virginia Beach, would you? No, I don't, unfortunately. As a matter of fact, Dr. Townsend in Virginia Beach was the one that gave me the uh, bioptic lenses, which allowed me to basically stay in the military for another, gosh, almost 10 years. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he was my first introduction into low vision aids. All right, well, I like the name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right. Oh, I don't see any raised hands, but does anybody else have any questions that maybe just unmute yourself and, and go ahead and, and, and ask the question? I, Tom, I see you have, why don't you go ahead and ask yours if you can unmute yourself? Or, um, I guess I'm not hearing Tom, so he has a question, I'm gonna ask that. It says that the comprehensive, right. the comprehensive care coordination between low vision optometry and BRS is starting. Um, is there a full implementation goal? And he has another question as well. Um, do you have data on TBI patients with vision impairments? We did uh, look for that information. We, uh, I had Ms. Gernhardt in my program office, the optometry program office. We looked at the OEF OIF, OND patients, and then also um, the ICD-10 code Z87.820, personal history of traumatic brain injury. And we looked uh, about the number of uh, patients who were in those seen in the low vision care clinic, the intermediate low vision care clinic, and the advanced low vision and Victor's programs. These are outpatient clinics where in 2019, we cared for over 22,500 patients, and so far through August of this year, over 15,000. Actually, when I look at September, it's over 16,000 now. And we found that in fiscal year 2019, there were about 810 veterans, and that's about 3.6% of the people who were cared for in those those uh, low vision clinics, outpatient low vision clinics. Uh, there are obviously less this year. Um, looked at that through, through August, there were 539 patients who uh, were identified that way and for about 3.5%, so around the same percentage of, of veterans with those two uh, designations, OEF, OIF, OND, and then that that uh, ICD-10 code for personal history of traumatic brain injury. So I hope that yeah. answers uh, one of Tom's questions. And then the uh, other is, is uh, the blind rehab uh, service. Uh, there, this coordinators are looking to also uh, have a listing of all the people with low vision in addition to those who are legally blind. Is, is that the question? Uh, I think that was the question. Yeah, I, you just well, oh, I'm going to state it one more time. He says the comprehensive cor care coordination between low vision optometry and BRS is starting. Is there a full implementation goal? Can y'all hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah, this is Melvin yeah. Gate with the, the Houston region. Uh, I have a question I want to ask Doc. Uh, if he has stem cell surgery. Can you have it a second time or is it a one-time only thing? 
I think that that question would uh, be better to go to the ophthalmology program director, Dr. Cockrum. You might want to ask. He may know particulars about that particular question about stem cell implants. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, I, from what I understand, the Blind Rehab Service is going to see all those people who have some level of visual impairment where they're not yet legally blind, and uh, I think that that's a good thing because then we'll be able to care for them and give them the, the best level of care dependent upon what their needs are and get them used to uh, our rehabilitation services that we provide uh, in the VA. And obviously there, these services can also be uh, contracted to community care. Okay, this is Melvin Gatewood again in Houston Region Group. Uh, before the pandemic hit, we were, I was discussing to go to the Visor Clinic here in Houston uh, I know I'm not saying the correct name, but it's another version of the CCTV that do more than the one that I have. Like the one I have just uh, uh, enlarged the letters. I think someone was saying it's one that read or something like that. All right, there are a lot of different electronic optical enhancement devices that are out there now that we didn't have 10 years ago. So they would more likely than not have some of the latest devices to have you, um, you know, look at when you do go for an appointment to see which one might work best for you. Okay. Dr. Townsend, there's another question in the chat function. It's from Mike Nissenbaum. He's asking, is the VA doing anything to provide a clear standard of what types of glass, glasses options are available to veterans across different visions? Uh, right now that's, um, the eyeglasses are provided through prosthetic service, uh, the prosthetic and sensory aid service. And they all have similar contracts, but they don't, uh, they do contract with many different uh, manufacturers uh, because they wanna make sure that they do it for veterans own, own businesses and uh, also other uh, places where uh, there's a need to have contracts uh, with, with uh, women veterans owned businesses, uh, disabled veterans owned businesses and the like. So Doctor, I, I think, I they think have what, what I'm trying to, to get across here is that I understand the, the want and need to contract across different uh, small owned businesses it's the standards that are out there is that you, in, in looking at the contracts that are coming out, a lot of the directors of prosthetics or the directors of optometry have put their own personal preferences into what they want to be able to provide to the veterans. Um, some of the visions will provide the veterans the opportunity to um, buy additional add-ons to their glasses so that they can have a pair of glasses that is equal to what they can get out in the open market, while other visions are limiting um, the veterans to only, you know, a pair of uh, either plastic or, or polycarbonate uh, lenses and a, a very low-cost frame. So there's, there's no clear standard that's across each of these visions in terms of what type of glasses are available. Some of the veterans get great service and others are, are not. All right, that, that's, this has been a problem for many years, uh, I believe. And we do try to work with prosthetics to see if we can have more clear guidance. My understanding is that uh, it's preferred for them to provide at no cost to the veteran what's written in the prescription if it's medically indicated. So it's part of that medical indication with, which I think is causing some of the variation in people's interpretation of that. Um, 
and I, I can tell you that there's been a, quite a bit of discussion with prosthetics about uh, this issue because there is the variation, as you mentioned. So other, other than the discussions you're having, there's, there's really no clear direction coming from the VA on how to handle this, is that correct? I think what the, the VA, uh, from what my take is, is that they would prefer that if the veteran wanted to purchase their own eyeglasses with, with certain features in them that aren't on the prescription, that um, that would be at their own, own cost. But something, eyeglasses that are medically indicated, the VA should be able to, should be providing that at no cost to the veteran with um, whether it's a polycarbonate uh, lenses or whatever is in the best medical interest of that patient. Right. I think the option here is that a lot of the visits do not allow the veterans to buy those additional things that they may want to satisfy their own desires out of their own costs. Yeah, and I think that that's what uh, there's been that, that struggle there because uh, I, I think from what I hear from prosthetics when we talk at central office, they would prefer not, n not to have these add-on sorts of things because they may or may not be medically indicated and, and that being paid for at VA expense. Right, but if a veteran is willing to pay out of their own pocket, wouldn't that be acceptable? Oh yes, and you should be able to get a copy of the prescription to take to whomever you would like to uh, purchase any and all eyeglasses on your own if that's what you would also like to do. So we probably have time for one more, one more question. There is one thing in the chat function that I'm, I'm not sure if it's a question or just a comment. It says, when you discuss visual impairment in the TBI population, you need to include visual perceptual deficits. Um, I'm not sure if it's being asked or if it's just a comment. Can you address that, Dr. Townsend? Or? Could, could you repeat that again? Sure. It's uh, when you discuss visual impairment in the TBI population, you need to include visual perceptual deficits. It was a comment, not a question. Oh, okay. It's, it's, that's yeah, there, something there that are functional needs to be addressed. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there are. So people can have, uh, you know, damage and then their ability to, their visual perception is impacted. Um, as you know, there the ICD-10 codes and things like that, the definitions of, of low vision by who, they don't really get into the visual perceptual deficits, but I know the VA optometrists are, are very aware of a lot of them and also everyone in, in blind rehab service caring for veterans who have visual impairment because it, it goes beyond just visual acuity loss or visual field loss or, or double vision. Hey, Stuart Falkomiski, can I get a clarification on something from Dr. Townsend? Did, Dr. Townsend, did you happen, when you're talking about the, uh, the, the low vision people, not the legally blind, are they going to be included into the VIST program itself? I, that's my understanding is that they're going to, uh, you know, track those patients more closely. Uh, that's my understanding. You might want to, to talk with uh, Ms. Sandlin, Sandlin about any uh, details about that because she's the one uh, director of blind rehab service. She's the one who would be uh, implementing that. But I think it's so that we don't lose these people as they start down the road where their vision could become uh, gradually worse over time or sometimes suddenly. So uh, I think it's good to get them into that level of uh, vision rehabilitation that they're gonna need in order to function uh, the very best and have the most um, independent uh, activities of, of daily living so that they can uh, manage uh, more for themselves uh, if they can. And I think that's, uh, you know, we do have, I think, in the VA, the premier program in uh, vision rehabilitation. I always thought that's what the Victor Advisor program was for. 
Yeah, that's uh, and we also do low vision care in an eye clinic. Uh, we also have intermediate level where there are certain uh, activities that that uh, veterans can be trained in using devices and things like that. Um, but then they also uh, we we've done some. Uh, I know Carolyn Irig has done some uh, low vision um, at CBOCs through uh, clinical video telehealth. And, uh, you know, they've been able to reach more people who might not come into a VA medical center or advisor program as they have up in uh, Buffalo, New York, um, in order to receive those services. I think that that's something that with the telehealth that we need to see how much more we can uh, introduce people to vision rehabilitation care and, um uh, you know, try to meet some of their needs that we can if they've already been seen by a uh, blind rehab center or advisor program and try to keep them uh, functioning as well as they can and come back in for additional care and services when they have that need. Well, Dr. Townsend, thank you very much for uh, spending this time with us today. Really appreciate it. It's been very informative and thank you for taking the questions. Um, hopefully we can uh, have you back again sometime, maybe even in person at a national convention. All right, that would be great. I'd, I'd be glad to uh, meet with everyone again. Thank you so much. And if you want to stay on, we're going to have just a little bit uh, more. So don't anyone go anywhere. Um, I'd actually like to turn the time over now to um, our, our representatives of OrCam Technologies. We have with us um, Michelle Mendez and, and Lena, Lena Lee. And um, I think they're going to share their screen with us. Um, why don't you go? Can you can you go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and yeah, go just ahead? Unmute, and, sure. Okay. And Hello. you can. I don't. I don't have very much information on you, so please go ahead and uh, introduce sure. yourselves. Absolutely. Um, Thank you so much for everybody for, for attending today to Dawn and to the BVA for giving us this platform um, to speak. I also have a, co a colleague of mine who's going to be assisting with the chat. Her name is Lena Lee and she'll be, um, she's not visual, but she is going to be uh, participating with us today. And I just want to introduce for those of you who are not familiar with OrCam to share, you know, what we are. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Are you all able to view my screen? Yes, I believe okay. so. Okay. Okay. So what OrCam is, and let me go ahead and move this out of the way here, is we are, um, we are a leader when it comes to AI-driven innovations that change people's lives. The goal for us is to provide independence to our users. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the MyEye. It's our flagship device. It's the device that we have had for several years. Uh, just recently, we have come out with uh, the latest version of the device, which is MyEye Pro, which I'll be demonstrating it to you shortly. But for those of you who are not familiar with, with OrCam, we were founded in 2010. Uh, we are headquartered in Jerusalem, Israel. The founders of our company were the founders of a company called Mobileye that bring you the anti-collision technology that many of you uh, may have seen in automobiles. So what we have become known as, so is an innovative, innovative wearable handheld device that increases the independence for individuals who are blind and visually impaired. And in 2019, we're very proud that we were, um, we were noted as time's best innovation or invention of 2019. Uh, currently, our device is available in 25 languages and in over 50 countries. Uh, we have a strong relationship with the BVA that we really value. And just a few years ago, we were featured on the Dr. Phil show. One of our, um, one of your veterans, Scott Smiley, who was blinded in action, was featured actually on the show and we had BVA members actually in the audience that also received devices. So once again, we very much value our relationship with the BVA. So the OrCam MyEye, it is the world's most advanced wearable technology for people who are blind and visually impaired. So what is it exactly? 
It is a small device. It's about the size of your finger. It weighs about less than an ounce. And what it does is it takes a picture and it conveys the information to you via audio by a little speaker that sits back by your ear. The device has the capability of, of being able to use with Bluetooth. It's very easy to use. It's a very intuitive device. And I'm gonna go into a little bit of a demonstration on the device here in just a moment. So what does the OrCam My Eye do? Well, we're known for, and its main function is reading text. So basically the device can read from virtually any flat surface. So whether it be a book, your mail, off your computer screen, your iPad, plaques on walls, it has the capability to read from virtually any surface. We've introduced, introduced a new feature, which I'm gonna demo for you shortly, called Smart Reading. We have also now on this new device, um, introduced a device or a feature, it's still in the beta form, but it's an orientation feature. The goal of that feature is to make you aware of your surroundings. So whether it's identifying a chair, a table, uh, computer screens, ascending staircases, doors. It's still in the beta form, but that, that software is available on the devices that we're dispensing currently. It also can identify money, different currencies, not just American dollars, but Canadian dollars, um, the Euro, the Mexican peso. The device can also recognize faces. So you can program up to 100 faces of friends and loved ones on your device so as they're approaching you, it's able to recognize those faces and let you know who is near. It's able to identify products. So things in your home that look and feel the same. I always, I, I'm very hands-on with the veterans here in Florida. So products that look the same, whether it be, uh, let's for example, Campbell's soup cans in your pantry. They feel the same, but you cannot decide, or you can't read to see what it is. The device can identify those products for you. The device also does barcode recognition um, and also color identification. The smart reading, I mentioned that's a new feature. It's new for us. Um, we just launched it during the, during the pandemic. And what it is, is it makes your device more interactive. So it empowers the user to simply ask the device for the text that interests them, such as reading newspaper headlines, the specific menus, and totals on your phone bill or dates. So I am going to stop sharing my screen here and I am going to do um, a brief demonstration. Are you able to see me okay? So we know that yep. the OrCam is ma mainly known for, for reading. So this is an intuitive device. It recognizes hand gestures. So the first gesture that I'm going to show you is the pointing of a finger. The pointing of the finger activates my device. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold the book in my hand. I'm simply going to point to the page. I'm going to wake up my device here because it goes to sleep. So taking a picture. Now the device begins to read to me. It's going to continue to read to me until I stop the device. There's several ways to stop the device. I can pull my hand right in front of me. I can put five fingers out in front of the camera and it stops the device from reading. I can also, once again, I'm gonna activate my device. I'm gonna hold my book in front of me. I'm gonna point with my finger. It activated my device. Now I'm just gonna to touch once here on the side of my device and it stops reading. Very simple. I always tell my users, if you are able to point, or here on the device, there's a touch bar. If I can slide forward on my device, I can control my volume. If I can slide back, I can reduce my volume. If I can tap, I can activate my device. If you can do those gestures of sliding forward, sliding back, tapping or pointing, you are able to use the OrCam device. Hi, Michelle Aquina. We weren't yes. able to see the book, Oh, I'm so sorry. View. So if you can maybe perhaps um, um, let me go back a little bit. Yeah, then we can get a better idea. Okay, there Thank we go. You. Okay, perfect. So I'm holding the book right here. I'm looking. Wake it up. And, oops. Point in my finger. It began to read. 
I want to stop the reading. I can put my hand in front of the device with five fingers. And once again, it stops the device from reading. Now, I would like to share with you, as we mentioned, smart reading. So it's a new, it's a new feature for us. It's an interactive feature. So some of the challenges people uh, really uh, have are, for example, reading a newspaper. So I have a newspaper here right in front of me. I am going to hold it and let me see if you can see the newspaper here. Okay. I am going to double tap on the side of my device. Smart reading. Please wait. Oops. Looks like my device is having a little issue here. Let's see. Smart reading. So it's taking a picture of my of my newspaper. I'm holding it in front of me. Now I can say, read the headlines. So it's read both of those headlines. Now I can select which one I want it to read. Read article number one. California's gasoline panic. Democrats in California have worked hard for years to inflate gasoline. Exit. Exiting. So now I'd be able to select the article that specifically interests me. Something else I hear from my veterans all the time is, is reading menus. The OrCam currently reads menus, but how much easier is it if you're able to ask it specifically what you want to read? So I have a menu here in front of me, and I am going to go back a little bit here. See, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm going to hold it in front of me. Oops. Touch to order. Jackson, 24 hours. Just a moment. Smart reading. So now I'm going to specifically ask it. Start from sandwiches. I didn't understand. Let's try again. Start from sandwiches. I'm currently in the doctor. And now it's going to begin to read for me specifically sandwiches. Exit. So I would be able to ask my device, for example, read the entrees, read the chicken entrees, or read the desserts, specific things that I would like for the device to identify for me. The same way that I do that, I could look at a bill and say, read the amounts or I could say, read the due dates. All, it's, all the end idea is to be able to help the user with things that they find difficult to identify. So I am gonna temporarily stop sharing my screen here. Or share, excuse me, share my screen. So who is the OrCam for? So OrCam is for people who are blind, people who are low vision, people who have reading disabilities, for example, um, dyslexia, people who have experienced traumatic brain injury, people who have mild cog cognitive limitations or expensive or experience reading fatigue challenges or facial blindness. The advantages of my eye. So it's access to information anytime on the go. So you no longer have to be at a, confined at a desk. You are able to take your OrCam and go read in your backyard if you want to read. It's access into, for information in the convenience of your home or portability of wherever you want to be. It's a non-visual aid, so you do not have to have vision to use the device. It's very discreet, small. Oftentimes, people don't even realize that you're wearing it. It's intuitive and it's hands-free. 
So if you are someone who has a guide dog, use a walker, use a cane, you're, you're completely hands-free with this device. It has voice commands. For example, I showed you here how we can enter into the smart reading function, but you can also ask your device to tell you the time, to tell you the date, uh, to speak faster, to speak slower. You, this device is run completely on batteries. You don't need any internet to use the device. And once again, it's a hands-free device. Privacy, we know that we're in an era where privacy is extremely important. So the device, the OrCam device, all the computation is done on the device. There is no export to the cloud, to it, your information is not held on any server. We do not collect any information. We value your privacy. So nothing is recorded. We have recently partnered with Leo Messi. So if we have any uh, soccer fans that are listening there today, uh, Leo Messi is a, um, he is a global uh, soccer star. He plays for Team Barcelona. He is an individual who we is now, we have partnered with to become our global ambassador. He, as growing up, he experienced adversity himself. So he has compassion for people who have disabilities and he is working with OrCam to create awareness worldwide. And I'm going to share um, a short video with you about one of our users. She's based out of Chicago. And let me share here just a second. Oops, excuse me. I hope that you all were able to to hear it. Michelle, I, I could not hear that on my end. But I'm so, so sorry. But that's okay. Um, I, we were able to see the, I mean, those that, that have some sight could see the, you know, the, the words, but maybe you could just summarize it. That's so okay. it was, um, it's a user. Uh, she is based out of Chicago and it was her introduction to Leo Messi. And she was showing um, her meeting with him and her actual use of the device with the new features is, is what, is what the, um, the video showed. Thank you. So I, I would encourage anybody who has questions by all means to, to put them in, in the chat, or if we wanna open up the chat, you can include um, you know, your, your phone number in there, and we are happy to answer any questions that you have on the device. So there was one uh, question in the chat that um, I think Lena answered it a little bit, but she said you could go into it a little bit more. Um, is there an update for people who already have an OrCam? 
So it depends on when you got your device, um, whether these, for example, these new features are, are available. Um, the best thing to do is to speak to your VIST or your BRO to see if your device is compatible with these latest updates. Okay, great. And then we have a question from somebody on a call. Um, their yeah, number is 264-0453. Yeah, go this ahead. Is Gate, this is Gatewood in Houston, Texas. Uh, the art cam I have is a little over three, three and a half, four years old. Uh, it worked by the fingertip and the touch control. Now, I know when I'm programming people uh, name faces and names, I press the button and I say their name. So if I'm at a restaurant, will it do voice commands or it have to be updated? At the lady just asked, the question was just asked, because I was so on mute when the question came through. Sure, sir. So is your device, your device is wireless? Is it a wi the wireless version? No, ma'am. It's got the power pack where you are. Uh, it, it, it's uh, got the, um, yeah, it's got, it's got the power pack. Okay. So you would have to update your device um, to, to the latest version to be able to, to interact with it, with the smart, with the smart reading feature. It's a new so, device. So other words, the one I have now, I would have to uh, 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 put it on the shelf and get a brand new all cam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so I'll have to talk with my coordinator. Yes. Okay, and I thanks. think I, I saw a question here, I believe, um, was it in reference to Bluetooth? The device can connect, yes, it is Bluetooth compatible. So you can connect it to earbuds, you can connect it to a portable speaker. Any other okay, questions? One, yes, one more question, it's Houston again. Uh, when I first got mine and we was programming it, it was difficult if, uh, uh, to get it because one time it said the light wasn't right. So we went outside and it still wasn't act right. So is the new one easier to program than the old the model say I have? Yes, sir. That's a very good question. And, and the device has evolved immensely from that version that you have. You most likely have the, the 1.0 or the 1.5 um, version of the device, and it is a completely different experience. It's much more intuitive, much easier to work with. So if you already have one, do you think the VIST people will let you get another one? Uh, you have to turn that one in on trade? Or... That, that's something that you need to speak definitely to your, to your local VIST coordinator about and, and check with them. All right, thank you. Um, I believe we have a raised hand. I think it's from Dennis. Dennis, can you unmute yourself and you can ask the question? Hold on, hold on, now I'm muted. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, I have the Orcan 2. Uh huh. Um, I heard you say that they're Bluetooth. <sighs> you can use the Bluetooth. Bluetooth compatible, yes, sir. Excuse me? Yes, sir. But I was told it wasn't Bluetooth. If you if if your device um has been updated to to Bluetooth, uh, you are able to use Bluetooth. There were updates. We introduced Bluetooth about a year and a half ago, approximately about a year and a half ago, Bluetooth compatibility on the device. So, so they are Bluetooth how, compatible. Just from my memory. Uh -huh. How does I, how do I get updated? Uh, you would want to connect your device um, to the Wi-Fi in your home. Did you ever connect your device to the Wi-Fi in your home? No, I use it for my um, cochlear implant. For your cochlear implant? Okay. What you can do, sir, if you would like to provide us um, with, with your information, I'm happy to have a local representative reach out to you and go over the process with you. Okay. Um, you want to take it now? Or? Sure, sure, absolutely. Dean's Dennis O'Connell. Dennis O'Connell, okay. And my phone number is 516-328-3438. Okay. Okay. And I'm in Long Beach, New York. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, I can have our local representative reach out to you. Thank you very this much. This is Houston again. Could I ask one more question? Sure, Houston. Uh, the device I have, like I said, mounted to the, to the frame, to my glass frame, and it's got the power pack. 
Now, your new device, how is it, how is it made again? So our new device is approximately the size of a finger, and it has internal magnets. We attach a magnetic mount to the leg of your glasses, and the device just adheres. Oh, okay. Just adheres to it. So do it have to have a power pack too? No, sir. Everything now is completely wireless, and it's it's all everything is all the computation, all the controls, everything is done on that device that rests on the leg of your glasses. Did so no more wire, on? no more wire to a a back to a power pack that you wear on your waistband. Much so more. So you would still have to charge it, though, right? Yes, sir. You still charge it. You plug it into the wall, and the device charges within 45 minutes. Oh, okay. You plug it in the wall just like you do your cell phone, and the device oh. charges. All right. Thank you. Hey, Michelle, oh. it's Lena. Yes. We have Hi, a Lena. question from Natasha. Will sure. Orkem do a trade-in? Um, if you are a, a, a veteran, you need to trade. Are you, are you a veteran, Natasha? You, you would just make sure you would check with your VIST or your bro to make sure that you qualify for an upgraded device. But that is definitely something that's up to your VIST or, or in your bro. Thank you. I, I believe she is, but I'm not sure. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Michelle, Paul Kaminsky from Florida. Hi, hi, Paul. I know you. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Hey, I'm back to the old, old issue, replacement yes, parts. How do you get replacement parts? My my one pair of glasses. Actually, I got two pairs of glasses. One pair. One of the magnets fell off. On the actual magnetic mount. Yeah, on one of, on the uh, glass. Yeah, I can send that out to you, Paul. If you want to give me your phone number, and I'll reach out to you afterwards and get your address, and I'm happy to send you some mounts. Okay, nine zero four. Uh huh. Five seven one. Okay. Six zero four one. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So we probably have time for a, maybe a, one more question. I can't comment see. or a comment. Yes, yeah, Ray Hale out of the Northwest. I, I, you know, I've had both models. I was glad to get rid of the one that you tied to a battery pack. It was always getting tangled up in some. But I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, being able to have. Uh, the one that's being demonstrated today. And uh, I, I've been to guide dog school where I lost busted glasses and this and that. And I uh, was able to get all of my rep and they sent me new mounts to go on my new selection of glasses. And it just, it's, for me, it's a matter of convenience. I use it when it's convenient for me. It doesn't read street signs for me and all that sort of thing. But uh, you have to be right on top of them, but as far as giving the independence, being able to read uh, the uh, you know text without carrying a, a large device around with me has, has been a pleasure. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. Anybody at want to ask one more question? Well, if not. Um, we just want to thank you both, Michelle and Lena, for being with us, um, sharing this amazing technology with us. It sounds like a lot of us have experience with OrCam technology already and have been using it. So uh, appreciate the updated information. And uh, we do have um, your contact information. If any of you want to get in touch with one of them, is that okay if we send them absolutely. to you? Feel free, absolutely. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for every, to everyone who's been with us um, today for both of the presentations. Really appreciate the effort in, in attending and as well as you guys that have participated and, and uh, presented for us. So uh, look forward to having you again, hopefully at a, at a national convention in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the veterans and to the BBA. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Stay safe. Have a good day. Have a great rest of the afternoon and um, we'll catch you all on the next uh, Zoom session from BBA headquarters.